Good morning, everybody. Our uh, reading this morning comes from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as it, you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly better to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning. Last time uh, we looked at Ruth a a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the context in light of the initial phrase, in the days when the judges ruled. And we saw there the repeated refrain, Judges 21-25, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so we saw there that when everyone follows their heart and their own wisdom, doing whatever they think is best in their situation, it results in utter disaster and chaos, the darkest days in Israel's history. God's people need a king to command them, a shepherd to guide them. We are like sheep We don't do well on our own. We were not designed to go off on our own. We do not grow into self-dependence, but instead the maturity of the Christian life is to grow more and more dependent on God's wisdom and the commands in his word. Now, during this time characterized by lack of leadership and tragic existence, we are introduced to a man named Elimelech, and Elimelech is a name which means, my God is king, which is ironic. Because Elimelech does not obey the commands of God, but instead he, like all the others in the days of the judges, followed his own plans and trusted his own wisdom to try and rescue his family from hardship. And so Elimelech's name demonstrates yet another aspect of the time of Israel's warlords, as we see depicted in the book of Judges. His name reflects the religious convictions of his parents, but his life choices show that he does not share the same faith. And this was a chronic issue in Israel during this time and afterwards, and is often the case 
even today it seems, that those who who see God's saving acts personally, trust in him for salvation, and follow his commandments, but in the following generations, who grow up in a time of peace, fail to pursue a personal faith, and by the third and fourth generation, the people do not even know who God is or what he really commands them to do. And this results in the crisis of Elimelech's family, as the initial scene is said in the first few verses, Ruth 1, 1 to 2. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judea, or in Judah, sorry, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. So the initial crisis in Ruth is famine in the land. The the natural cause is not mentioned. The ancient people didn't know how, although it can be presumed that the rains, critical for the growing season in Israel, had failed to fall. But the, the natural cause is not what is important here. In the context of Israel's covenant, such a famine could only be explained as a judgmental act of God. According to the covenant curses and blessings outlined in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, if Yahweh's people would go after other gods and persist in rebellion against their covenant Lord, he would respond not only by sending enemies to destroy their crops and to occupy the land, as often is the case in the book of Judges, but also by cutting off the rains and sending famine. And so this consequence is specifically predicted in Leviticus 26, 18 to 20, and in Deuteronomy 28, verses 23 and 24. So famine is a specific response of God to unfaithfulness among his people in the Old Testament covenant. Again, the given context in the days when the judges ruled is key, because we don't have a hard time imagining how Israel has earned the covenant curse of famine. And there's no thought that this might be just some random famine, especially given that Israel experiences this famine while their next-door neighbor, Moab, does not. And so these verses are, are rife with irony. Bethlehem, which means house of bread or granary, has no food. Elimelech, whose God is his king, acts as though he has no king, and does what was right in his own eyes. Designing his own solution, instead of calling on God for mercy and repenting of the sins that his family and his nation had had fallen into and had plagued them during the dark days of the judges. And so moving the family to Moab is also an ironic solution because being scattered into the countries around them was yet another one of the covenant curses as seen in Deuteronomy 28, 64. To to seek refuge in Moab was both shameful and dangerous. And so Elimelech responds to one judgment by inflicting yet another judgment upon his family. And then there are the names of Elimelech's sons, which are either some very brief foreshadowing or an expression of hopelessness during the famine as he names his boys Sickness and Dying. Malon and Kilian are ominous names which implicitly point to the intensification of the crisis about to strike Naomi. Verse 3, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years and both Malon and Kilian died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Out of the frying pan and into the fire, as they say, this family escapes famine only to walk right into the clutches of death. It's vitally important to understand here that for a family line to end, what was also known as being cut off from Israel was a significant and severe consequence in light of the Old Testament covenant. Part of the blessing for covenant faithfulness was a fruitful family and the continuation of one's lineage, Deuteronomy 28.4. 
A right relationship with God meant the continued presence of one's descendants in the land of promise. And so there was a a couple of promises to faithful Israelites. Their family would continue. And this mattered far beyond what we would think of now. Their salvation hinged on continued descendants. Because someday there would be a descendant who would come who would be their salvation. And nobody knew which family this was through. And, And spoiler, it was a Limlex family. Elimelech's family was the family through whom the Savior would come. And so it was very important that they not be cut off. And they would also lose God, the inheritance God had promised them, the, the land, their inheritance, the entire inheritance would be lost should the family line end. The land would be transferred to others. The family name and legacy would not be remembered. But worst of all, being cut off came to signify the ultimate judgment of God upon a family. It meant a permanent loss of what God had promised to faithful Israelites. And so only the truly wicked in the Old Testament have this consequence. Eli and his family, they're cut off. Saul in his rebellion against God is cut off. Achan, who steals treasures out of what was promised to God at Jericho, his, he and his family are cut off. This is ultimate and permanent loss. And so in this case, first Elimelech dies... And I should point out here that being buried in a foreign land was another of the covenant curses, uh, the second worst fate that any Israelite might suffer. But not all is lost. Elimelech's line may still be saved by his two sons, as anemic as they might be. And these, verse 4, took Moabite wives. But because Moabites were pagans, worshippers of the false god Chemosh, these marriages were forbidden by God's law. Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4 says, You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. And so the author uses a term here which usually describes illegitimate marriages to show that this was yet another rebellion against God's good command. And once again, the choice of Elimelech and Naomi's family not only deserves, but produces the covenant curse. For marriage to foreigners in the land of exile was considered the judgment of God, according to Deuteronomy 28.32. See what's happening here? Some of these judgments are directly from God, but a a, a huge number of the judgments that they're suffering are self-inflicted. They have, by their choice, by doing whatever seems right in their own eyes, they inflict themselves with further judgment. And then the closing report that they live there about 10 years is not an incidental detail. First, verse 1, they went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Then verse 2, they remained there. And now in verse 4, the family has become more and more firmly planted in Moab, has intermarried with Moab. There is little chance that this family would ever return to the people of God. In fact, they would be swallowed up by Moab. The sons have already married Moabite wives. And God's prediction is if they were in the land and married to Moabites, they would become Moabites. The family has become planted in Moab. But remember the end of the story. God has determined to rescue Elimelech's family, to sustain their line, and return them from their land. And how does he do this? I want you to see, how does God go about doing this? Well, first of all, he lets them suffer their self-inflicted wounds. And he brings discipline and judgment. In 10 years of marriage, the sons lived with their Moabite wives without fathering any children, which must be understood as yet another consequence of their disobedience, Deuteronomy 28, 18. The covenantal implications are clear as Yahweh withheld the rain and thus produced the famine, so he withheld fertility, hence no children. Against all expectations, there are no children born to both couples over a period of 10 years. And finally, both Malon and Killian died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. As I had said earlier, in Israel, there's no greater tragedy than for a family to cease to exist. And now the family of Elimelech teeters on annihilation. Not only has the family of four suddenly shrunk to one, but that survivor has lost all her identity. Rather than being called by name, she is simply called the woman. As a widow, she lacks the basic 
things that will sustain her life. She lacks the provision and protection of a husband in a male-dominated ancient society. Further, her, her age and her poverty effectively seal off the options normally open to younger widows, as returning to her parents' home was probably past the point at this time, and remarriage was probably off the table if her own sons were old enough to have been married for 10 years. If burial in a foreign land was the worst-case scenario for Elimelech, the worst possible fate for Naomi was to be an aging widow without children or grandchildren. And so the author quickly sets the stage by compressing a good number of years into just a few verses in order to introduce the book's main problem, Naomi's emptiness. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept, and they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. The initial conversation in scene three contains the first report of God's direct action, his compassionate provision for his people. The house of bread is being restocked. One of the main things that I hope for you to see today in this passage is that God judges rebellion against him. But in the case of his covenant people, he relents before there is any ultimate loss or extermination. He judges his people, but he does not judge them to the full extent of what they deserve. In fact, they deserve a lot worse. But he preserves his people. He now visits his people in their distress, which he caused, and gives them food. And so also the word mercifully comes to Naomi that God had relented in his judgment before Israel had come to nothing. And in this way, both the nation's current situation and its future hope in Elimelech's line are secured. But Naomi can offer her daughters-in-law little hope. In fact, her perspective is that they would fare far better if they were to separate from her. In her next speech, we will see that this comes from a thoughtful logic, all the human wisdom that Naomi can muster, all the good advice she could give them is go, go back to your own people. The death of a husband meant the loss of one's economic support base and the severing of connections to their kinship structures. Widowhood often meant inevitable alienation and destitution. And so while there's not much hope for the elderly Naomi, the two younger widows are advised to return to their homes and to find new husbands. Naomi prays for the girls, verse 8. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Naomi has two wishes for her daughters-in-law. The second one is that the Lord would grant them rest in the house of a future husband. In the the patriarchal context of their day, a present without men was a future without hope. There was just nothing for women. There was no trades for women. Um, there, There was just abject poverty. The the rest that she asks God for is more than a good night's sleep would provide. It is all the context of settlement, security, and freedom from anxiety. This is what this rest speaks of. It is primarily something which only God gives, and that is why Naomi seeks it from him for these daughters-in-law. But her, her first wish for them that she expresses is that God would extend his hesed to them, which is translated here as kindly. This is that word in Hebrew which cannot be translated with one English term. It is a covenant term, wrapping up in itself all the positive attributes of God's love, covenant faithfulness, mercy, grace, kindness, and loyalty. In short, it refers to acts of devotion and loving kindness that go far beyond the requirements of duty. When we talk about the love of God, being the specific love of God for his covenant people, this is that word hesed. 
God loves the whole world, but there is a, a hased for His people, His covenant faithfulness, His covenant loyalty and mercy and eternal love. And so Naomi asks this covenant loyalty from God upon these Moabite women on the basis of their having performed acts of hased, loving kindness on behalf of the dead and herself in the past. Because they were loyally loving her and her family, she asked that God would loyally love them. Now, Naomi may not have realized that her prayer was explicitly in line with the expressed will of God. And she certainly could not have guessed how God would bring it about. But this was the promise God gave to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. As daughters who had blessed the people of God, it is now appropriate that Naomi blesses them in the name of God and asks for his covenant faithfulness upon them. And this promise Jesus extends to all his followers in the New Testament, Matthew 10, 42. Whoever gives even, or who gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Insomuch as these Moabite women have shown kindness to the least of the Israelites, Naomi, so may Yahweh show kindness to them. It makes all the more sense why Naomi recommends that her daughters-in-law now leave her and perhaps experience the covenantal blessing and the rest of Yahweh without her when we recognize that she believes that God is attacking her. Verse 11. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, what seems like a passionate plea addressed to the women actually amounts to a lament accusing God of cruelly botching up her life. Naomi is a bitter old woman who blames God for her crisis. She feels that she is the target of God's overwhelming power and wrath. The irresistible power of God, that same hand of the Lord that had struck Egypt with plagues, and destroyed a generation of Israelites in the desert, and punished the apostatizing nation of Israel in the land of Canaan, was now stretched out against her. In Naomi's eyes, Yahweh has attacked her as an enemy. So why should these women follow her? She highlights that it would be unlikely they would find husbands in Israel by suggesting that she would be their only option, that, it, that an heir or a, a husband might come through her. And her questions are a little bit more crass than the translation allows. More literally, it reads, Have I yet sons in my guts that they would become your husbands? I am too old for a husband, and even if I should find a man this very night and bear sons immediately, would you wait for them to be grown? And so Naomi exhausts all the possibilities in her mind. She's she's weighed out this. She's, She's thought about what it would be wise for them to do. Just like Elimelech, she is grown uh, habitually uh, in this way of choosing whatever way seems best, doing whatever seems right in her own eyes. And so they should not follow her. But the clincher, her final argument, is that if God is against her, they should get away as fast as possible, lest they share her fate. Her earlier tragedies, famine, exile, bereavement, childlessness, might be only the beginning I couldn't find it, but uh, there's a BC comic. Remember the old, the old cavemen where a man's standing on a hill next to a snake and he starts to say something blasphemous and the snake starts running so that the lightning won't hit him? She's like, get out of here. You know, I'm the focal point of God's wrath. Flee. It's better for you to go back to the gods of Moab than to stay with me under the wrath of the God of Israel. Naomi's theology is far from perfect. But we should not miss the great theological importance of her outcry. And by holding Yahweh responsible for her losses, Naomi affirmed his participation in the events. 
Thus, despite appearances, things were not out of control. They were not out of God's hands. He is intimately involved. That God is actively behind these events will be affirmed throughout the whole story. Nowhere will it deny that God has caused these things. In fact, it was what God had promised to do for unfaithful Israelites. It's ridiculous to suggest that God wasn't the cause of these things. But God is not out to get her. Verse 14, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her, and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, and it has like a, (laughs) may the Lord do whatever to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. It would be a mistake to fault Orpah for leaving. There's no criticism offered by the author. She accepts the wise counsel of the older woman as an obedient daughter and leaves with Naomi's blessing upon her. Were the story to follow her future, it might report Yahweh's fulfillment of Naomi's good wishes. Orpah does not serve to show someone who fails, but serves to highlight how extraordinary was Ruth's conduct. Orpah did the, the sensible, expected thing while Ruth went far beyond responsibility and realistic expectation. In this, Ruth truly reflects the Hesed of God. One of the key themes in the book of Ruth, and, and totally why the book is called the book of Ruth, even though it's about Naomi, is that God expresses his Hesed, his covenant faithfulness to her through two other people. People who have experienced, in a way, the Hasid of God and now begin to treat others in the same way. And by Ruth's faithfulness, Naomi will be saved. Once again, verse 15, uh, Naomi urges Ruth to return to Moab. This time, she urges her to return to her people and to her gods. And this is a troubling comment that seems to show that Naomi's theological understanding is as flawed as most of the characters in the book of Judges. If she represents the highest level of faith in Israel, it is no wonder God had sent famine on the land. The first act of the book reaches its climax now as Ruth declares her answer in verses 16 and 17. Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. From where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. It's no wonder this book is named Ruth. The Moabitess renounces her family, her familiar surroundings, her religious traditions, a foreshadowing Jesus' own teaching that to be his disciple requires one renounce all family ties for the sake of the kingdom of God. Like the covenant of God towards his people, Ruth's covenant with Naomi is one-sided, a, a unilateral covenant without condition. It is a covenant not only unto death, but beyond. Where you are buried, I will be buried. It is a gracious and total commitment of oneself to another. In this, she images the Hesed of God. With radical self sacrifice, she abandons every base of security she could have clung to in a formal pledge of commitment, a transfer of membership from the people of Moab to the people of Israel, and allegiance from Moab's gods to Israel's God, Yahweh. Now, how much she knew at this point about the implications of claiming Yahweh as one's God, we do not know. She had been observing Naomi for more than a decade, but that might not have taught her very much. (laughs) From what we've seen of her in this chapter, she would be hardly qualified to be a missionary for Orthodox faith and theology. 
The, the reader can only hope that when she arrives in Bethlehem, she will find better role models who practice piety more perfectly. And something we will say, see later in the person of Boaz. Can you ask my daughter to be quieter? Thank you. Verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirring because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? In Israel, names were not just labels of individuality, but descriptions of inner character, which in turn were presumed to influence the person's conduct. For Naomi, the contradiction between her name, uh, lovely or the pleasant one, and her situation was too ironic. Instead, she asked to be called Mara, bitter. For the Almighty Lord had taken everything from her. He testified against her, called her to account, and declared her guilty. Naomi attributes nothing to chance, but everything to Yahweh, as though there were no other force in the universe. In this, she has rightly understood God's great and unassailable power, but not his faithfulness and goodness. This has been one of the key flaws that I have had in my Christian walk. I was able to quickly come to understand that God is sovereign. The Bible describes that all things are in His power. He practices meticulous provision. Nothing happens that He does not cause or allow. And He can stop anything from happening at any time. And then I conclude in my evil mind, He's unfair. Why would he allow me to go through these really hard things? Why would he do these things to me? He is powerful, but I struggled to see that he was good. Naomi is unable to see the human guilt and causation in Israel's famine and in her own trials. She recognizes God's control, but that has only resulted in bitterness. She ascribes sovereignty to God, but this is a sovereignty without grace, an omnipotent power without compassion, a judicial will without mercy. When the curtain falls on Act 1, Naomi's bitter outburst seems to overshadow Ruth's beautiful pledge of commitment. In this first act of Ruth, we see God empty Naomi as she claimed. She's right about this. He did empty her. But we will soon find out in the story that he has not been her enemy. He is her faithful Lord who keeps his covenant of love. Even upon her wicked generation. God lovingly disciplines Elimelech's family, both directly and indirectly. Directly in the case of the covenant judgments of famine, infertility, and death. God caused these things. There's no doubt about it. This was what God promised to do for unfaithful Israelites. And he disciplines them indirectly in the case of exile to Moab, which they chose. Intermarriage with pagans, which they chose. And burial in a foreign land, the result of their decisions. But though they deserve it, God will not cut off Elimelech. Neither will he allow the famine in Israel to wipe them all out. He relents from discharging the full judgment they deserve because of his covenant faithfulness. This is a common theme in the prophetic writings of the Old Testament. In Hosea, God declares his terrible judgment upon unfaithful Israel, the famine, plague, and sword. But then he eventually relents and can't help but to express his love and compassion for his people. Hosea 11, 8-9. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? 
My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So what should we learn from the first act in Ruth? First, your hardship, even your tragedy, may not be judgment for sin or sins, but we dare not quickly come to that conclusion. Like Naomi and Elimelech, none of us is receiving worse from God than we deserve. This is a lie I have told myself many times. I don't deserve this. I've been good. Instantly, I put myself in the place of Christ, the only good one, the only one who has earned any favor from God. We dare not come to the conclusion that we are receiving worse from God than we deserve. A good, holy, loving God is not in the business of glibly using the death of family members as pawns in a game to get us to know him better. He's not glibly using your suffering to somehow make you get a little stronger. You know, if I, if I saw a father that was beating his child and saying, oh, it's okay because he'll be tougher after this. This would not be a, a good and wise and holy man. God is not abusing you, misusing you, causing tragedy so that you will get to know him better. He is in the business of judging people, for that is his prerogative. Nobody's receiving what they do not deserve. And in dis God's discipline, sometimes we receive parts of what we deserve, but he relents. He does not destroy us. Hebrews 12, 5 to 7 says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addressed you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wearied when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? We may rail against God for the bitterness of our situation without recognizing that it is the result of sin. And when we do this, we sit as evil judges over God and malign him. God does not cause evil against you that you do not deserve. God gives us some of the responsibility, some of the recourse of, of what we have caused in our own life. He allows some of our choices to negatively affect us. Some of, some of my sinful motivations and sinful choices turn around and bite me. Sometimes I suffer consequences. Never is it God giving me some suffering I did not earn. Elimelech dies. You know what God's law promised a man like Elimelech? Death. Exile into Moab. That his sons would be given in marriage to Moabite daughters. That he would be buried in a foreign land. And that he would be cut off from his people. Now, all of those happened to Elimelech, except the one that did not serve his good and God's glory. God allowed all of those horrible things to happen that he deserved in the punishment that God had promised for those who walk in disobedience, all except for ultimate and permanent damage. Imagine thinking that a good and holy God is, is causing an unfair suffering to me. And yet that is the wickedness of our human minds. The second important message, and I've already alluded to it several times, is that despite experiencing suffering as the result of disobedience and unfaithfulness, the Lord's love is not restrained by our actions. 
We cannot undo or unravel the hesed, the covenant faithfulness of God. Because we could not earn God's love in the first place, we cannot lose it. The book of Ruth is a beautiful depiction of Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. We're meant to see in the book of Ruth that this emptying of Naomi we see in the first act is what is totally necessary for her filling in the last. If God were to withhold all discipline from Naomi, what would have been the situation? Where God say, no, 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 I, I'm, a, I'm a nice God. I'm, a, I'm, I'm super polite and nice and I don't do any of the bad things the Bible says, what would happen to Naomi? She would go into Moab, and she would become a Moabite and suffer eternal damnation. And all of Israel, in this case, because Elimelech was in the line of of King David and Jesus, the, the whole nation would be lost. So God, in his purposes, keeps them, loves them, God chooses from all eternity past to set his covenant love on his own forever. His hased never changes or ends. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That's that word hased, the steadfast love. The hased of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. And it is the choice of a totally good and absolutely holy God. And so goodness always comes to us as part of the package of love. God's goodness always comes with his love, which we see in this story. When you hear the story of Jesus' death on the cross to satisfy God's wrath against sins we have committed, when you hear of his resurrection from the dead that offers life after death and power over sin to all who believe, and then you turn from living life apart from God to trusting in Jesus, you begin then to experience the love that God has set upon you since eternity past. Let's pray. Father, I first want to repent on behalf of our congregation and certainly on behalf of myself for having judged you and maligned you and considered you to be less than perfectly good, less than a good and trusted father. I have railed against your discipline. I have lied and said I did not deserve it. Forgive me, O Lord. Create a new spirit within me. We come also to you this morning in great thanksgiving and joy for what wondrous hope we have when we have experienced your hesed, your covenant faithfulness, your steadfast love and loving kindness. Your mercies are new each morning. And though I suffer nothing that I do not deserve, I suffer far less than what I deserve because of the finished work of Christ Jesus. Thank you, God that you only allow the consequences which will cause me to be sanctified. You only allow the consequences that will allow me to reach heaven, to ultimately experience true joy and fulfillment in everything Christ has earned. Thank you that you have withheld anything of ultimate judgment, anything that would be permanent. For even my death is a temporary thing in light of eternity. What wondrous hope and joy we have in you. We give you praise. Amen.